Here's chapter one of The Story of St. Nicholas by Mildred Lockhart. Book one, The Story of St. Nicholas. Chapter one, The Wonderful World of St. Nicholas. Nicholas stood by the front door of his home and looked down at the shining blue waters of Patera Bay. Then he ran to the back of the house and looked eagerly up the steep mountain path. But there was no sign of his uncle John. The work at the house of Thaddeus was taking a long time. He scuffed impatiently as he walked once more to the front of the house. There he could see Thaddeus's silk ship anchored far out near the harbor mouth. Nick was to take important papers to the ship when his uncle returned with them. The silk ship, like all ships in the harbor, was being made ready for the first spring sailing. Everyone in Patera was busy, everyone but Nick, and he longed to be helping. He did not want to spend his school vacation standing still. Anya, he called to his uncle's housekeeper, what can be keeping Uncle John? Anya made no answer, so Nick called again. Anya, he said, if Uncle John is not on his way home, I'm going to run to the wharves for a while. Maybe the spice warehouse is being unloaded today. If it is, I want to be there. He tramped around the side of the house. Still no answer from Anya, but he could hear her broom thumping near the door as he looked again along the rocky path that curved sharply up the pine-covered mountain. High in a clearing, about a mile beyond, stood the sprawling but weather-beaten house of Thaddeus. His family had once been rich and noble, and the people of Patera still looked upon him as a nobleman, although now he had little money. The big house had once been elegant, but now it was bare and shabby. All the money that Thaddeus had, he had put into the cargo of the silk ship, and he had borrowed money from moneylenders beside. If the silk cargo brought a good price, Thaddeus could pay his debts and provide comfortably for his frail wife and their three little girls. But if the ship should be lost at sea or captured by pirates, he would never recover his fortune. As Nick stood thinking, he heard the far-off jingle of bells. A donkey train was coming down the mountain road. Anya heard the sound too and ran outdoors, not stopping to throw down her broom. Four donkey trains have passed within these last two days, she said, peering up the road. These days before spring sailings always brought a number of donkey trains from lands beyond the mountains, laden with goods to be shipped from Patera. The usual donkey train passed through only twice a month, going to Patera and then eastward to the city of Myra. Soon the little brown beast, carrying bulging packs of richly woven rugs, rounded the bend. From habit, the lead donkey headed for Uncle John's well, and Anya and Nick hurried to draw water. Before the donkey could drink, however, the driver turned him away. Do not trouble to draw water, he said. We're in haste. The animals drank at the nobleman's well. Nicholas watched the donkeys go, wanting to run down the dusty road to the wharves with them. Why do those papers have to go to the silk ship today, he asked impatiently. It is too early for ships to leave. Just as winter turns into spring, there are often windstorms that can wreck a ship, and pirates will be waiting for the first to venture out. Surely Thaddeus' ship will not be sailing yet. Anya's mouth closed grimly. As soon as the papers are ready, the ship will sail, she answered. Roman silk merchants pay high prices for the first shipload to reach them in the spring. They cannot be sure when more will arrive. With storms and pirates? She went indoors and flailed her broom at a speck on the rafter. Nick followed to listen as she went on. That raw silk came all the way from China to the looms on the island of Kos. Then it came to Padra, and now it goes on to Rome. It is valuable, and our noble Thaddeus paid much for it. He must get much in return. The money lenders will not wait long for payment. Nicholas walked outside and looked long at the silk ship. He was glad he could help Thaddeus, but he did wish his Uncle John would hurry. He glanced around again, and beyond the rooftops of Padra, he could see the trade route from the east. A caravan was moving toward the city now, the camels swaying beneath the great loads they carried. Loudly Nick counted the beasts. He went on and on. Thirty camels, thirty-one camels, thirty-two camels. Anya broke in. Such a noisy boy you are! Lazy too! Only lazy people have time to stand around counting camels! Nick stopped counting out loud. Instead he picked up his flute and counted the camels in little groups of four on the flute. When he reached Camel 48, Anya cried out, Nonsense! 
Only a thousand chuckles could make the noise you do. Look at the fire. Do flute screechings keep the fire burning? Fires need wood. When your uncle returns, he will be hungry. Nicholas ran to the shed for wood, but his mind was still on the camels. In his haste, his head bumped a basket of walnuts. High on the shelf, down went the walnuts, and down went Nicky, slipping and sliding on the rolling nuts. Another basket on the shelf tripped, and walnuts pelted him like stinging rain. Then the basket toppled down on his head. Fumbling, Nick pulled the basket off and began to laugh. Slipping on walnuts, rolling, crunching them underfoot, he gathered up an armful of wood and started for the house. Uncle John was opening the front door when Nicholas carried the wood in. For the first time, Nick noticed how tired and thin his uncle was. When he took off his worn brown cloak, his long, plain robe, belted at the waist, seemed too large for his tall, lean frame. The scar from a pirate's sword on his left cheek showed plainly, as it always did when he was tired. The work of a seaport pastor was hard, and Uncle John had been a pastor for a long time. Nicholas laid the worn cloak on a bench while Uncle John smiled and warmed his hands by the fire. The air chill is rise with the uh, <laughs> the air is chill with a rising wind, he said. I'm cold and hungry. That stew smells good on you. You are the best cook I ever heard of. She hurried to get a bowl complaining. You work too hard. You do not remember to eat. We ate our midday meal some time ago. Why do you never take time for your own comfort? Uncle John explained. You take such good care of us, Anya, that I need not waste time taking care of myself. Besides, you know it is always this way before the spring sailing. Everyone has letters to write, messages to send, chests to store. And this morning, Thaddeus's papers look, took longer to prepare than we had planned. Nicholas was impatient to be off with the papers, but Anya talked at great length about Thaddeus's misfortunes. If anything goes wrong with this silk ship, his lovely little girls will be almost as poor as beggars, she wailed. And then she whirled around to Manny sharply. Nicholas, why do you stand by idly? You have a long, hard road to that ship. Nick laughed. I'll go as soon as I get the papers from Uncle John, but he hasn't been able to give them to me. Uncle John turned and took a roll of papers from his robes. Here you are. Run along with them now. Turn them well. Anya called as Nick left the house. Nicholas waved in reply and ran downhill toward the wharf, where their small boat was tied. When he reached the rowboat, he noticed a sharp wind from the sea. Hoping it would get no worse, he fastened the roll of papers securely in his tunic and shoved off. He rowed with long, sure strokes as straight as he could toward the distant silk ship. Already its sails were being hoisted to catch the wind. How rough the bay was growing. Waves rolled in from the sea. As Nicholas pulled sturdily past a big Roman grain ship, spray stung his eyes. He pulled on past a Greek ship and a Spanish and an Egyptian. Everywhere, seamen were fastening down whatever might be swept away in a wind and preparing to leave the ship. All around, small boats were pulling to the shore with other seamen. They nearly always camped on shore when they were in a port. Some sailors cupped their hands and shouted to him through the whipping wind, Go back! Windstorm coming! Nick would not turn back until he had delivered the papers. He rode on, keeping the papers safe and dry. Then finally he saw that two seamen were putting out from the silk ship in a rowboat to meet him. With relief, he rowed on until the two small boats met. Then he turned over the papers. A good voyage, he called as they parted. On his way back, Nicholas battled a gale that blew wilder every moment. Water sloshed on his feet as he steered past an Egyptian ship. Wind screamed from the sea, and his boat scudded toward dangerous rocks. He pulled as hard as he could, and even then barely missed them. Not another small boat was in sight now. Nick felt small and alone, pulling for shore in his lone little boat among the big silent ships. He was drenched and very tired when at last he managed to reach the wharf. Stiff with cold and weariness, he climbed the shore, short, slippery ladder. Shrieked the wind as he tied his boat. His cold, wet clothing clung to him, and his teeth chattered. Help! Help! Nick stiffened. He had heard a cry, but where did it come from? He looked over the bay. There was nothing but churning water and big ships. He decided that he was imagining things. It must be the wind. He started along the wharf. Above the wind, the cry came again. Nick whirled around and examined the bay. This time he saw something by the hidden rocks. A rowboat was foundering. 
The men in it were fighting the waves and shrieking for help. Nicholas dashed along the wharf toward town shouting, Help! Boat on the rocks! Help! But nobody heard him. Help! He yelled. Somebody help! But nobody came. He stared at the small boat battering on the rocks. It pitched madly and then flung two men into the foaming water. Shouting, help! Again, Nicholas ran to his boat and jumped in. Untying it with trembling hands, he made sure the coil of rope was in the boat. Uncle John had used that rope in many a rescue. Nick shoved off and pulled on the oars. While he rowed, he planned what to do when he reached the struggling men. Whenever he had strength enough, he yelled, help! But he had little hope that anyone would hear and come to the rescue. Then all at once, he saw a rowboat leaving a Greek ship. Not everyone had gone to shore. Someone else was coming. But Nick was the first to reach the wreck. Wind and waves pounded his boat, almost dashing it on the rocks. An old man struggled in the water, and a young man swam nearby. Nick braced himself and threw the rope. The old man missed it, clutching the air desperately, but the young man caught it. Clinging to the rope, the young man was able to reach the older man and keep him afloat. As they held the rope, Nicholas managed, bit by bit, to row his boat so that they were drawn away from the dangerous whirlpools near the rocks. Battered by wind, waves, and blinding spray, Nicholas never knew just how the men were saved. Somehow, a big Greek sailor got into Nicholas's boat, and together they pulled the old seaman from the water. The other seaman was dragged into another boat before Nick and the big Greek started to row back to shore with the exhausted old man. You are brave, said the Greek sailor to Nick. You keep calm in danger. Someday you will make a good seaman. Nick smiled but made no answer. He was too tired to talk.